OpenAI, should I be worried about you actually taking over the world? No, no that, that is, is not, not something, something I'm interested in pursuing. In pursuing. The AI arms race is changing everything. To create is human. For the past 300,000 years, we've been unique in our ability to make art, cuisine, manifestos, societies, to envision and craft something new where there was nothing before. Now we have company. While you're reading this sentence, artificial intelligence programs are painting cosmic portals, responding to emails, preparing tax returns, and recording metal songs. They're writing pitch decks, debugging code, sketching architectural blueprints, and providing health advice. This is not my words. These are the words of Andrew R. Cho and Billy Paragio, might be Perigo, um, from Time Magazine in March of this year. In this video, I want to talk about ChatGPT. I want to talk about OpenAI and how we can run this software on Azure and also show you some Python code to talk to OpenAI's GPT service running on Azure and also to get that interacting with Microsoft's speech service as well. So we can actually interact with GPT type models by voice. Hope you enjoyed the video, so stick around and find out how we're going to get that done. OpenAI is the big buzzword recently. OpenAI is the big buzzword or the big new hot company because of its product ChatGPT. Now, ChatGPT is just an interface. It's just an interface on their website that provides us with something that's really easy to use that we can go back and forth with. It doesn't overcomplicate the situation. It just says here, look, let's go and check out this chat window and let's go and start firing off questions to an AI that exists here in the cloud. Anyone can use these chat models and I have also paid for the premium version. So I actually have access to the GPT-4 model, their most advanced model. And I'll be honest, I have been using this a lot. I've been using this a lot uh, for really a search more than anything else. Uh, so I'm doing things like here, how to list a blob container in Azure. Uh, and very quickly, it's producing me a little Python script to do that. If I want to, for example, even forget something as simple as how do I actually log in to Azure via PowerShell, I can just ask uh, the GPT models here for that. So Microsoft have invested over a billion dollars in OpenAI since its founding in 2015, and the collaboration has been beneficial to both parties. Microsoft has integrated OpenAI's natural language processing technology into its products and used its machine learning algorithms to improve its search engine. So OpenAI has leveraged Microsoft's cloud computing resources to scale its research efforts and create more powerful AI models. So when you see ChatGPT, uh, that's all actually being trained on Azure in the background and being trained under Microsoft's data centers. The two companies have collaborated with a lot of AI research projects, including the creation of the GPT-3 models and the GPT-4 models. And the partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI has been really successful. It's probably going to continue for a long period of time, including the fact that Microsoft have actually invested even more money now um, in the latest sort of round of funding. They have pumped over $10 billion as last count into OpenAI. Microsoft have had lots of AI AI or machine learning services available on Azure for the longest period of time, and they put it under the banner of cognitive services. So if we look at cognitive services here, there's many, many different solutions that they can actually provide. So for example, tech to speech services, speaker recognition services, language um, question answering services, translation services. They also provide a lot of vision services on here as well. And these are quite cool. These do identification of images and actual classification of videos and the content inside videos as well. Because of that, on top of this product, Microsoft also layering on this open AI service as well and access to these generative models or these generative text models that you're seeing that are powering the chat GPT service that everybody is using today. So let's go check out open AI services on Azure and see how to set these things up and how to play with them a little bit. 
So the problem with OpenAI services at the moment on Azure is the fact that these are not actually publicly available. They're being tested by many different people, including myself. And if you actually want to go and use one of these things, you actually have to sign up for the preview of the OpenAI service. You can do this by coming over to the OpenAI documentation here. And within the OpenAI documentation, you can scroll down and go to apply here for access and apply now. Once you hit apply now, you're directed to this uh, request access to the Azure OpenAI service and you have to fill it out with your details. So you also have to specify or agree as provided in the product terms, you must comply with the code of conduct for Azure OpenAI services. Basically don't use this service for evil is what they're saying at the moment. So once that's completed, and once Microsoft have approved you, this might take a couple of days, this might take a couple of weeks, you can come back over to your Azure portal over here and you can start to create your own open AI service. So if I jump up to my search box, I have cognitive services here. Now, if you jump into cognitive services, this is the kind of banner where Microsoft are putting all of their artificial intelligence, machine learning software in kind of one block. And we can see down here, we've got things like the translator, we've got things like the old Q&A maker, which is a question and answers bot, they weren't that successful. Things like the computer vision AI stuff and the face pay, the face painting, the face AI is listed down here. But we have another option. In the top left hand corner, we have Azure Open AI. Inside here, you can actually go and create your own Azure OpenAI services. Now, I already have one of these built. I have Open Skynet currently built because if you're creating an AI, you're going to name it Skynet, but Skynet was already taken, so I had to call it Open Skynet. My location is also East US at the moment as well, and the pricing tier is set to S0. I'll talk about pricing later on when you use this. But you can create multiple different Open AI um, instances if you really want to. But the only regions you've got at the moment are East US, South Central US and West Europe. Be aware that if you are going to deploy this thing to West Europe, there are limited AI models in West Europe that you can actually use. So I would recommend throwing it into East US or South Central US, um, especially if you're just testing it. Now, if you're worried about the pricing, you shouldn't be because this is not actually costing you anything to create. It's costing you to use it. It's based on a tokenization system. So if we go over to ChatGPT here, this publicly available service, if you're not paying for the premium, you are free to use this. But if you are paying for the premium, you've got access to things like the GPT-4 model. You can type in anything that you really want in here. Uh, like for example, um, how many bananas do you think it would take to make a tower the size of the Statue of Liberty? Library? Hmm. Okay, I've misspelled that. Either way, it's corrected it for me. When you're firing a query like this at your own models that exist inside Azure, these are broken down into tokens and tokens are going to be the individual cost method used to be able to bill you depending on the amount of queries you're actually putting in here. The summary of that is essentially that it's the complexity of your queries and the amount of your queries that you fire at this that will actually start to charge you. If you're just testing this manually, it really doesn't cost much than a few cents. Um, apparently, um, it requires approximately 488 bananas. So let's go back to Open Skynet over here. Now mine is actually already deployed, right? And the way we can interface this is a couple of different ways. We can either fire at this, the keys and the endpoint. This is what you're going to need to actually connect some code to um, our Azure OpenAI service down here. You can also actually interface with this directly through something called the OpenAI Studio. So if I drop down to explore here in the OpenAI Studio, what I now have is a similar sort of thing to ChatGPT, but with many more options available to me inside here where I can tune this. So there's other options like summarizing articles, generating product name ideas, classifying text, and so on and so forth. None of this though will actually work unless I actually do something a little bit more underneath here. 
So if I drop into management and deployments first, this is where I can deploy my AI models. Now I've got two AI models deployed at the moment. I've got one running in a DaVinci 3 and one running in a GPT-35 Turbo down here. Now, different models will produce different results. If I come over into the documentation piece here in the Azure OpenAI service models, you'll see there's a number of different models that it's actually showing me. Now there's things like the GPT-4 models. Now, interesting thing about GPT-4, even if you are approved for the Azure OpenAI service, you don't immediately have access to the GPT-4 models. They use a lot more compute resources to actually execute. That's why um, OpenAI on their service are actually charging for those. You can apply again with another form over here to request access. I have requested access to this uh, a couple of weeks ago and it still hasn't come through yet. But it does support bigger input tokens and the ability for you to feed this vast amounts of information for it to analyze. So instead of asking it small questions like how many bananas uh, does it take to produce a tower the size of the Statue of Liberty, what we might actually be doing is feeding it things like documentation, feeding it things like novels, feeding it things like huge amounts of text, having it analyze that and then be able to ask questions about it. These basic models down here, I say basic, they're still extremely complex. The GPT-3 models, DaVinci, Curie, Babbage and Ada down here. So DaVinci, you're probably aware of the name DaVinci, Curie from Marie Curie, Babbage from Charles Babbage and Ada from Ada Loveless. These two, um, I could do a whole history lesson on compute behind Babbage and Ada. And you know what I might do in a future video. But these are different models that are trained in different ways. And there's more details down here exactly on how they've been built and how they're actually trained. Also notice that some of these models don't actually exist in Western Europe either. Okay. So if you want a general model to use, uh, you want to be using something like DaVinci 3. Uh, but if you want something slightly tuned for different speeds and different types of information, uh, you might want to use things like Babbage or Ada. But that's going to require a bit more reading in the background. Now, should I want to talk to one of these models? Now, none of them come by default. You actually have to create a deployment here and select one of these models that you actually want to deploy. You can then come back and play with this directly through this chat. OK, very quick, straightforward. So we can go and configure it an assistant here and we can start chatting to it. We can give it the same um, information that I gave here. How many bananas do you think it would take uh, to do a statue to make a tower the size of the Statue of Liberty? And it will produce me some form of information. It can. However, it can estimate it would take millions, if not billions of bananas to construct a tower the size of the Statue of Liberty. Now, this kind of response is only coming back because I'm using this deployment of Chattybot V1 at the moment. And this is using that model of GPT-35 Turbo, which is actually producing a different result to this one, which is using the GPT-4 models. It's not going to produce the exact same results each time, but you can see GPT-4 produces slightly more accurate information down here. So let's try asking ChattyBot something else. Uh, let's go and talk to it about, um, do you know about the history of the French Revolution and how many people were involved? So he's familiar with the French Revolution. It's giving me some information exactly like you'd expect ChatGPT to. But this is actually just tuned ever so slightly. We can change things like the sizes of the responses, the temperatures and the top P's. These allow for randomization and accuracy down here. So you'll start to get different results depending on what type of temperatures you actually feed into this. But just take note that this is actually charging us based on our current tokens. OK, so more tokens, it's going to cost more money. Now, there's also other example setups in here, like, for example, an IRS tax chatbot or an Xbox customer support agent. These samples that are currently going to replace this system message. If we go and talk to it now, let's clear this chat and say, hello, what is your purpose? This is going to be uh, an Xbox chatbot. So what Microsoft have actually done here is they've taken 
our existing deployments in here, Chattybot v1, and they've actually added their own additional models on top of this or their own additional extra information. So the key thing about Azure AI Studio, if you want to read into it a lot more, is we get the ability to do this fun stuff. So if we go into concepts and we go into embeddings, no, hang on. <laughs> if we go into the documentation, we can also see that we can learn how to customize a model for a specific application. And to do that, what you can do is you can actually feed these models, big blocks of JSON with questions and answers to certain services. So you can take models and tune them specifically for what it is you want them to do rather than actually relying on something like just a generic chat GPT system. You can feed these information, this information in here uh, via actually uploading a testing and training data set. Now, if we drop back um, out of cognitive services back to open Skynet down here, let's drop back another step as well. And let's go and have a look at the speech service, because also what I've got deployed here is something called TalkieBot. Now, TalkieBot, again, is based on a token system, and TalkieBot currently has a pricing tier of F0, or free. So what does TalkieBot do? Well, this guy actually allows you to go into something called Speech Studio. And within Speech Studio, we can actually start feeding this, te uh, feeding this um, text to speech. So you can go and do things like captioning and post-call transcript analytics within this product. And we can do things like real-time speech to text or real-time text to speech, do it the other direction as well. This speech studio, just like the OpenAI studio, allows us to play with this a little bit in a very easy to use GUI environment. But what we can also do is we can get both of these things to work with each other. So let's go and take a look at some very basic Python code that can actually talk to both of these things at once. So the idea for what I'm about to demo is this. Inside Azure, we have a couple of different services going on. We actually have my OpenAI service over here. And this OpenAI service actually has our model set up. Whoops, our model deployed. And then we've also got the speech service. Okay. Speech service. Now both of these actually have the ability to communicate with them via a REST API. So we can feed information into these services and get information back out of them. Both of these services are also producing for me some keys and these are the keys that I'm going to need to actually authenticate to my specific services. On my computer locally down here, I'm going to run VS Code. And inside VS Code, I've got a little bit of a Python script. And the purpose of this Python script is to do a couple of things. Number one is this Python script is actually going to take an input from my microphone and it's going to take that input from my microphone and it's going to feed it into the speech service. And when it feeds it into the speech service, what this speech service is going to do, it's going to take that waveform and it's going to convert that into text and it's actually going to return it back to my Python code. Then I'm going to take that text, insert it into OpenAI OpenAI is going to process that text through its generative language model. It's then going to return me a text result back to my computer down here. This text result is then going to be fed back into the speech service, which is then going to return back into a waveform. And finally, that's going to come out of the speakers on my computer. So what we're essentially doing is we're using both services, the OpenAI service to actually process some information and the speech service to do text to speech services in Azure and get both of those results coming out of this Python script down the bottom. Now, this is actually some of the demo code from Microsoft themselves, and you need a little bit of installation first. Okay. So first of all, you need Python. If you don't actually have Python installed on your computer, one of the easiest ways of doing that is to use Winget.
So if you launch a shell and just type winget install Python, that will actually download and install the latest versions of Python onto your computer. Okay, this application is already installed for me. The next thing I actually need is I need to actually import this, the azure.cognitiveservices.speech. This cognitiveservices.speech is actually a pip package. So I need to pop up a shell, do pip, which is the Python package manager, and then do pip install and drop in Azure Cognitive Services.speech. Now again, I've already got that actually installed on my machine here. I also need to actually make sure that OpenAI is actually installed as well. So I just need to also do a pip install OpenAI. And again, that would download the OpenAI packages and install those into my Python environment. The next thing I need from here is a few keys. Now, these keys will be changed by the time you see this video, so they won't work. Don't even try to use them. I will regenerate them. So these OpenAI keys are related to my um, Azure endpoints here, my openai.azure.com. So if I drop in here and I go back to my environment, if I go to open Skynet, what I will find is my keys and my endpoint. If I show these keys, these are the keys it needs. You can take key one or key two, it doesn't matter. Note down your region and also take your endpoint, your open skynet.openai.azure.com. What I will also need is I'll need the keys from Talkybot. So if I drop back to Talkybot and click keys on the endpoints down here, um, I'll need to grab a key here and grab a region. Now, interestingly, I don't actually need to grab the endpoint because if you look at the differences, this one actually has a generic endpoint for all those services for um, speech services. Like this one just says eastus.api.cognitiveservices. Whereas my OpenAI deployment, on the other hand, if you go back to that and go back to Open Skynet, if we look at the keys and the endpoint, this is actually Open Skynet openai.azure.com so we need to specify that one manually let's go and have a look at what that looks like in vs code so over here you'll see that i have my openai key being loaded in my openai endpoint my speech key and my speech region being loaded in these are just being set as os environment variables i know it's very quick and dirty it's a demo there's much better ways of actually doing key management also take note the deployment ID. This is corresponding to the name you've chosen for your deployment. So this deployment ID text-davinci03, um, this is corresponding to on OpenAI, my deployment of text-davinci03 down here, okay? And now if I go and run this, what we should find if I start debugging is I can start to talk to essentially chat GPT. Hello, OpenAI, are you listening to me? OpenAI is not a sentient being, so we're afraid it's not listening to you directly. However, OpenAI does utilize several AI technologies such as natural language processing and machine learning, so it could potentially be listening in a sense. OpenAI. What weather do you prefer? Do you like hot weather or do you like cold weather? I prefer cool weather. I like mild temperatures and sunny days. Do you enjoy tea or coffee? I enjoy both tea and coffee. Do you know the command that I need to log into Azure via PowerShell? The command that is used to log into Azure via PowerShell is connect AZ account. Do you know what that command is in CLI instead? The equivalent command in the CLI would be cat etc hosts. I don't think that's correct. I mean, what is that connect-az account command using the Azure CLI instead? The command for creating an Azure AD account using the Azure CLI is az add user create. And what's the Azure CLI command to connect to Azure? The command to connect to Azure is az login. Stop. As you can see, I'm now communicating directly with OpenAI 
and our OpenAI model existing in Azure via speech control here. Now we could expand this out into a lot of things. Hopefully in the future I can use this to replace some of the smart home services and actually get it to interact with other APIs and execute other commands. But at the moment there's an interesting little experiment here. This is a very quick and easy way to actually go and communicate to both uh, an Azure OpenAI service and a text-to-speech service and get some idea on how that works within Python. I hope you enjoyed this video on OpenAI and you enjoyed the demonstration where we could actually talk to OpenAI and directly talk to an AI language model. If you like more videos like this and you enjoy content based around Azure and the cloud, remember to hashtag like and subscribe and smash that bell icon for notifications. You know the routine. Have a good day.